Hi, everyone. So welcome to this session. This session is about application lifecycle management in a serverless world. So my name is Xiang Xian, and I'm a senior solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. So why serverless are diff is different, and why it's important? So just like one hour ago, we had a great session downstairs talking about a serverless. What is serverless? and uh, What's the current state of serverless? Here, I just want to share some of my personal experience. So about 20 years ago, I started as a C programmer, doing a little bit of C++ on a Unix platform. So if you know those languages, when you do this kind of programming, you have to manage a lot of system resources yourself, right? If you want more memory, you allocate them. When you're done, you free them. If you forget, you've got memory leaks. You also need to know quite a bit Unix, right? If you use incorrect APIs, errors such like segmentation fault or call dumps will happen. So when I start programming in Java, it's such a different experience, right? So you don't need to manage those system resources anymore by yourself. Memory allocation will be taken care of by JVM. And uh, if you write a code, you compile once, you pretty much can deploy to anywhere and run them, regardless of your operating systems. So that's great. And also improved a lot my productivity, and I had less bugs in my code. Why? The reason being, I think, it's because JVM and Java really raise the level of abstraction, which is super important in software engineering. A lot of time, we're just talking about different abstraction levels, right? So the point here I'm trying to make is Serverless computing is also raise the level of abstractions. So talking about EC2 instance, you still have the patching, OS, da 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 da. And for the containers, good. It's Docker images. You have one more level up. But talking about the serverless, that's a dream world for a developer. Don't need to take, think about like servers at all, right? You just upload the code, boom, it runs. So, oh, by the way. I'm not sure you know the news. A few weeks ago, Dr. James Gosling, Gosling joined AWS. He is a creator of Java and JVM. So welcome, James, and uh, it's great to have you. OK, I paid my respect, so oh. <laughs> One other famous quote I, would, I like is the cloud. The cloud is a supercomputer. Serverless lets us program it. So. That's my opinion, my thoughts. And in the slides, what I list pretty much are like benefits of a service. They're not really defined service, but the benefits you can get from a service. So because there's no server, actually there's servers, you just manage for them. But for your perspective, there's no server. You don't need to provision any servers, manage them. There's no EC2 instance type you have to choose. There's no patching, those things going on. So reduce your work a lot, right? So when you have more workload, it will scale automatically based upon your usage. And because you just pay what you use, and you will not reserve capacities, capacity. So you're never paying for any idle capacity, right? Because there's no idle capacity at all. So we also have availability and the full tolerance built in. So we don't want you to think about uh, choose uh, like multiple availability zones and uh, redundancy those kind of things, right? So you are excited. You may be asking, what kind of use case? Can I use it? The answer is yes. Today, we have a lot of successful use cases based upon service computing. So I just list some, list some common use cases, like web applications, um, backends for mobile and IoT, data processes. We have a number of customers running large-scale data processing based upon serverless computing. So serverless, serverless computing also powered like chatbots, and it's also behind like Amazon Alexa. If you have an Echo or Dot at home, then my kids like, love it to play with it, right? So it's also based upon serverless computing. Of course, you can use it for your IT automation, right? It 
respond to events. So for example, if somebody checking a code or something happened, like security group changed, um, SNS, SNS event happens, you can use serverless computing, basically Lambda functions, which is a core service of serverless computing to react to those kind of events. So reduce your work, reduce your resource you have to manage. Oops. So how it works? at the very high level, that's architecture. So serverless computing basically follows a event-driven pattern. At the heart of serverless computing, we have AWS Lambda. <laughs> AWS Lambda, sometimes people call it like a function as service. So basically you write some code as a function, you upload it, then that's it. So code can be based upon Node.js, Python, Java, C++, C Sharp. Today, right? Uh, we probably have more in the future, I don't know. Uh, so, event will come from event sources. We have a wide variety of event sources you can use. When event comes in, it will trigger your lambda function. So your lambda function just ask, ask you, it can talk to all the AWS services, can talk to an API, API gateway, and it can talk into any service except like API calls. So pretty much anything you can think about it, uh, you can run it, right? So for event sources, so I didn't list all of them, but these are like most common ones, data stores. Um, you update something in a database, DynamoDB table, you upload a file to S3, it can trigger event. Those events can trigger a lender function, right? So endpoints, such as API gateway calls, uh, some events from Amazon Echo. And also like development and the management tools can trigger events too. So of course our messaging service, SES, SNS, and like events, CloudWatch event can trigger land function as well, right? So that's my quick introduction of serverless computing. If you wanna know more, we have a lot of blogs, white papers, and the great talks, videos, so you can feel free to explore. Let's go back to application lifecycle. So at very high level, we think there are four major phases for lifecycle. So first one would be source. Basically, you're, we're talking about you do source control, right? So you have a repository, then people check in code, check, check out the code, you do tagging, you have your branching strategy, merge, these kind of things. Then when a developer checking in code, you want to build it. Like for Java, C++, you want to compile them. For PHP or those like Ruby kind of things, you probably just zip them up. Uh, maybe you run some linked or syntax check, unit testing. Uh, like in Amazon, we do lots of like uh, static analysis for our Java code. Uh, check style, make sure you follow the style, right? You don't want to use tabs, you want to use spaces. And uh, you also want to try to find all those security problems. Like we have 45 which is a product to scan your code, find all the security issues. We have found bugs to make sure uh, you will not fall into some common like errors kind of thing. When your code has been built past all those checks, then the next step would be deployed to a sort of like testing environment. The reason being is a lot of times, if especially you follow like microservice or service or in the like kind of architecture, you cannot test locally on those services. You have to de depend on this. You have to call some APIs. So you have to deploy to some environment. And a lot of times you have, want to have a controlled environment, so you have dependencies. You don't want to say, developers say, okay, it works in my environment, but it, it's broken in a test environment. I don't know why, right? So, and sometimes like user experience testing or performance testing, you have to have some environment, right? So you want, like for example, performance testing, you want your environment very close to your, like similar to your production so you can get like meaningful metrics. So some concepts, uh, continuous integration. People probably are already familiar in this room, but just like go with them. Uh, CI, continuous integration basically means some people checking a code, some developer checking code. You just push them to a build server, build them, make sure everything is fine. You sort of automate those two steps from source to build. So you have a continuous integration. Usually you have to, also have a feedback loop, right? Something happens, your build broken, and uh, it will send an email or page somebody say, oh, you have to fix this, right? Uh, I, I heard some 
dev teams, they have some sort of like unicorn pass over. So you broke the build, they will put on something on your table, say, you have to fix it. Continuous delivery. So when you build your code, you have your packages, you deploy them to a testing environment, then you do all those testings. When you finish, you go to production. Then usually there's a gate, you can see from the slide. Those gates usually like manual approval, uh, legal approval, uh, those kind of things. The point here is, from a technical point of view, your code is checked in, goes through all those testings, it's ready. When go to production becomes a business decision. So a manager approves, it goes. You don't need to wait, just maybe click a button or run a script, it goes, right? A step further is continuous deployment. So you don't have this gate, everything's automated. So I was amazed when I joined Amazon like a year and a half ago, I was like, oh, so many pipelines in Amazon actually really adopt the continuous deployment strategy. It's not uncommon a developer joined the company like the first week, they're checking some code, it went to prod. So that's how we can innovate really fast, right? Uh, but of course, we have lots of testing and we have a strategy to load back in case something's wrong. So CICD for serverless application, uh, of course, there's some unique cha challenges and there's some difference, right? Because Lambda function is a unit of deployment. You usually don't have a big like a wall file, or jar file, or zip file for everything. You probably deploy, you update one function, then you deploy it. So the function would be your unit of deployment. And for a large application, a lot of times you have multiple Lambda functions, right? Like microservice, you will not have one service. You probably have like hundreds of like even more. So that becomes challenges to, uh, challenging too. And Lambda function also is event triggered. So a lot of times you have event trigger. Like for example, S3 or SNS will trigger your Lambda function. This event source could be just for one Lambda function. It could be for like multiple of them. So that's also a challenge over there. And the service, serverless application is typically a combination of different services like S3, DynamoDB, API Gateway. It's not just only Lambda. So that's also a challenge over there. What we want to achieve, so a lot of people, most like large enterprise, I think they already established a sort of like a CICD process. So they're pretty familiar with it. So for a service application, we try to adopt the same approach, right? We, we want to have pipeline, we want CICD. So it will become a developer checking a code, we want the code be sort of build, deploy, test, and deploy, right? And we want some integration testing, then we want to like test from end to end, all those like good things from CICD pipelines, right? So when it comes to think about service applications, there are a, lot, a number of like different components will be involved. So I just list some like popular ones. There are a lot of them. So AWS Lambda would be the core service. API Gateway is another core service. Then we have AWS Step Functions. Step Function is relatively new. The service, it allows you to orchestrate a lot of Lambda functions and manage the state for you and pass the state around. Because essentially Lambda is a stateless, right? It will not keep the state for you. If you're familiar with it, it have a timeout after five minutes. If you're not there, it will stop you. But you can use step functions to pass a state around, which is really nice. And of course, S3, DynamoDB, Kinesis is a stream service, and SNS is our notification service. So one of the best practices we recommend from in AWS is that you manage all those resources using an approach called infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code, the best tool we can recommend in AWS is CloudFormation. So for those people you don't know, like CloudFormation is a managed service allows you to create those templates and define all the resources you need. Uh, could be anything, pretty much anything in AWS. VPC, EC2 instance, API Gateway, uh, RDS, a lot of things. So you create those templates. Then you pass the templates to the backend service. The backend service will pass those templates and provision all the resources for you. The nice thing about this is now you can treat your infrastructure as a code, so you can version control those templates. 
you can replicate them, you can share them, you can use these templates to stand up different environments across accounts, across, across regions, a lot of good things, right? So advantages also you can use those templates in your CI CD process. And the cloud formation supports JSON and YAML. YAML is like more human readable, like more much nicer, right? So example of a cloud, for, cloud formation template. Don't worry, it's not supposed to be read, read by you. <laughs> Just give you an example, say, oh, that's cloud formation template. So this template will stand some resource for you. But you can see that's quite a bit text involved, right? That takes a little bit of effort to do these kind of things. So we ask ourselves, can we do better for service applications? The answer is yes. So back in the of 2016, we came up with something called serverless application model, SAM. So SAM has a, this mascot of like little squirrel, has a lambda on the top. So basically it's a extension of cloud formation. It's optimized for serverless. It defines some new resource types like functions, APIs, and the tables. It also can mix with existing cloud formation resources. So anything cloud formation currently supports, you can use them. And it's an open specification with the Apache 2.0 license. Uh, we have, uh, I have a GitHub link over there, you, you can check it out. So sort of party basically can look at it and probably implement. This is the same template. If you look at it, it's much shorter. What it does essentially is the same thing as the cloud formation template I just showed you, right? It has three sections. The header has a transform. That statement defines its uh, same template. So you can see we have a model version over there, AWS serverless, a time step. So we probably have a new version in the future. Then there's the resource sections. In the resource section, you can see we define a lender function. The lender function has a type called like a serverless function. Then it has some properties. We have the code, the handler, runtime, it's like Node.js. Then it can define a policy, so it's IAM policy. So it can have events, where the events comes from. In this example, you can see that event actually comes from API Gateway. Then at the bottom, I have a table, serverless simple table. Basically, it defines a DynamoDB table. But you can see, I take all the default values. What I did, I just like have a table name, a type. That's it. The nice thing is that when I deploy it, Cloud Formation can figure out all the permissions, IAM roles, and what's the default value, and just stand, stand up everything for you. So much less work for you. Another example. So there's about like a 10 lines of same template over there. And we have a tool called Cloud Formation Design. It comes with Cloud Formation. So basically, you can pass the template. It will try to give you a visualization of the graph. So you can see these 10 lines actually generate two permissions, one function, one IAM row, plus two API stages. So just like 10 lines. If you use like Cloud Formation, like probably much longer. Uh, a bit more about the template. So I already said, uh, said I mentioned like three new resource types function. So that's a function, right? And you can define a handler, runtime, and the memory size. It's megabytes based, timeout, up to five minutes currently. Then you have a policy. So you can define environment variable. So you can pass some environment variable over there and the events. This example the events is from S3. So somebody, for example, upload a file, a trigger event, then you can do something. The famous example from us is like resize the image. API, so not much here. The API resource type will define uh, API in API Gateway. It takes Swagger, a YAML file, as input as well. You can write them out, but Swagger is fine. Swagger, uh, for those you don't know, Swagger is an open standard for API, so supported by a lot of different languages. Uh, it's open, it has some really nice license. And again, you, have, you can define some properties over there. Simple table. So my previous example, I didn't have anything. I just have a type, so it has default value. But here, actually I define a primary key and read-write capacity. 
other capabilities of Ceph. So again, it can mix it with un, some other cloud formation resources, right? S3, Kinesis, that functions, support the use of parameters, mappings, outputs, those kind of like standard capability from cloud formation. Um, supports interest function, I usually call it a building function. Um, can use import values, which can allow you to import value from some other stacks, cloud formation stacks. Uh, there are some small exceptions over there, but maybe we'll have some improvements over there. Mm -hmm. Again, it support YAML or JSON. Uh, JSON is not that human readable, but it's really nice for programs to read it, so we support both. All right, so we know how to have our infrastructure as code use same, define same template. It comes to build and deploy it. We actually, you, of course, you can use the web UI to deploy your Lambda function, which is okay, but in terms of CI, CD, it doesn't make sense, right? You cannot go to web UI to do something. So we actually create new, two new commands in the CRI. So basically, AWS Cloud Formation, then we have those two new commands, package and deploy. What package does is it creates a deployment package for you. Basically, it's a zip file. So it would, up, it would upload the zip file into S3 bucket for you automatically, and it will get to the code URL from this upload location and inject it back to your output. So in a, dynamically, it, it knows where is the location of the code. Then you have the deploy. Uh, deploy is based upon cloud formation change set. So you call it deploy. First thing, it will create change set for you. Then it executes it and deploy all the changes for you. So we have the building blocks. So we have to lay out our strategies, how to test, right? Um, I already mentioned that you have to go through all those testing stages. Uh, I'm not sure why good developers, but I think any developer should know you need different environments to do different things, right? You don't want accidentally mess up your production because you made a code change. So you don't want, uh, when you do performance testing, your customer suddenly cannot open anything. Then how to do it? We have something to think about it, like account strategies. So how we do infrastructure as code. And we can use environment variables for different environments. Then we want to do a lot of automations over there. Uh, one thing I want to mention is how to configure multiple environments. That's very important for large enterprise organizations. That's very typical, right? So you have to make some trade-offs over there. And so the easy one would be you just use a single account for all your teams. Uh, if you're a small team or just individual developer, that works very nicely. You have everything in a single account. You have a visibility over there. But if your team grows, you have mod multiple teams. You have different organizations doing development, it becomes hard, right? So usually people have multiple accounts, dev account, multiple dev accounts, QA accounts, production accounts. So you can separate all the resources or all the permissions and just have better control over there. And if you do multiple accounts, we actually have a very nice service called AWS organizations allow you to manage those accounts really nicely. So check it out. So for the environments, the best practice, best practice we recommend is you have one template file for multiple environments. If you think about from a infrastructure as code kind of perspective, it makes sense, right? You want to follow the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. You don't want for dev environment, you have this template, test, have this template, then you end up, if you make change, you have to change all the templates. You want to have a single template, then based upon environment, um, some certain conditions, you just use it for different environments. So how you can do it? The possibility is like you can have a template define all those environments. Then in your Lambda function, for example, you can reference those different environment variables. So the ref is a building function in cloud formation, allows you to reference to some other resources. So nice, we have the environment laid out, we decide we have multiple environments, maybe multiple accounts, then how we are going to build a deployment package. So different languages, long times, have different approaches. Like for Node.js or Python, you don't really compile, right? So basically we just zip up everything and uh, with your dependencies, just create a zip file. For Java, 
um, you can use uh, some plugins like Maven, Eclipse. Basically, it will put all your libraries on the slash lib, or you do some sort of like a shade jar. Basically, it will open all the jars for you and put all the class into a single jar. And for C Sharp, you can have all the DLLs and the wizards of zip code. You can run it manually or you can script, but we have a service to help you. Code build is a fully managed build service. So think about it as Jenkins. So it's like build engine. You put a code over that, it will run the build job for you. You can upload your own doc image to the build, and out of the box, we also have some images for you, and it will scale automatically. So if you have a lot of developers, they will not compete for a dev, like a build server, they will not wait around. So based upon the usage, we will automatically scale, and it pay by the minute. So it's really nice, so you don't have a build server sitting there doing nothing, or in the middle of, in the, in the night, like 12 hours, there's no build job at all, then you have a server sitting there. So this one is like, we, you pay by minutes. You have a build job, nice. If you don't, you don't pay for it. So it also can be integrated with Jenkins and of course our service code pipeline. So recently we also added a test action uh, in code build because for like PHP, Ruby, Python, uh, a lot, lot of times it's, that makes sense. it doesn't make sense. You just test it, uh, build it, right? You, you probably need to kick off some testing script. So how you do it? For code build, basically you need File called build spec. This file can you think you can think about it as a build script or some specification file. You can if you look at we define some environment variables. Then we have different phases. So at install time, what kind of command you want to run? So pre build you can do like lint yes lint which is a popular lint tool for JavaScript. Scan your code. Then you can do testing. Then you can see I have a AWS Cloud Formation package command over there. So it will package resource for you your function will and upload to S3. And the output would be another YAML file and the beta JSON could be a property file. So the stage of testing is nice. You have all those automated. You package them, you deploy them, so you want to test it, right? So I already talked about unit testing, you check syntax, you check the style, make sure the format is good, then you do unit testing. Then for serverless applications, you also want to make sure end to end you can have some testings uh, because sometimes it's really hard to spot like a problem locally, right? What we have is we have a lot of partners and third parties and also open source tools integrate with us. So I'm not going to read all of them for you, for you. So some code inspection and test coverage tools over there. And the one nice thing I want to point, point out is that we, uh, Atlanta, uh, Atlanta just released a local stack which allows you to have a local like DynamoDB local environment running for your Lambda function so you can test, So which is really nice. Then we have some API interface testing over there. Then there are a lot of like open source and third party. Okay, you, we have everything. Then how to orchestrate and automate and have the workflow. So we have this service as called Code Pipeline. Uh, it's inspired by our internal serv service called Pipeline. We use it a lot. We eat our own dog food. It works really nicely. It's the most favorite tool inside Amazon for developers. So what it does is it's a continuous delivery service. It's fully managed, very reliable. Um, it can model and visualize your release process. So it can have different stages to build, test, deploy, and also integrate with some third-party third tools and do your, do your testing. And of course, it can deploy. And the one thing I feel really nice is pipeline is actually pretty cheap. So if you have a Git kind of repository, you can branch easily, right? It's pretty cheap. You have a feature or you have a bug fix, you branch it off. Same time, you can also stand up pipeline and just hook into this feature and just test this one. It's really easy. When you finish, you just delete it. So it will be very easy. Not like traditional tools. If you set up this pipeline, it's pretty fixed. It's not flexible. It Take a lot of effort to build and destroy it. Example of delivery via code pipeline. So that's just one stage. That's a beta stage. So we create a change set. 
we execute it, then we do some int integration tests. Yeah. Another example, uh, minimal pipeline. I'm not sure it's minimal, but the point is, from source code we build, then you, see, you can see we have a testing stage, multiple testing stage for different purposes, then finally we deploy the code to production. Then you can see I also highlight a manual approval step over there. So that's not really a continuous deployment pipeline. It's actually a continuous delivery pipeline. So somebody has to manually approve the deployment. So quick recap, put everything together. For source, we provide you a code commit service. Then we have the build. Then we have a lot of testing tools, third party open source for your testing stage. Then in the production, we can use code deploy, deploy your code, I mean, if you're going to EC2 or Docker. And for Lambda service, actually, you can use CloudFormation like Sam. And you can use code pipeline to orchestrate everything, have a very nice workflow. And back in April, we released this really cool service called CodeStar. So it's a little bit confusing. We have CodeStar, we have CodeStar. So CodeStar actually provides you, provides you a unified interface. So sort of like dashboard, then you can see all your development, development activity over there. You can see your pipelines over there. You even have a small week. Actually, I have a demo when I finish my slides. Uh, you can add team members, then you can choose a variety, choose a project template from a variety of like project templates, uh, support a lot of different languages, which is really nice. So you automate all those process. Now one thing, one very important thing is you need to have a feedback loop, right? Something is broken, you want to know, you want to fix it as quickly as possible. So you need like metrics and the logs. So just uh, like, this afternoon, I think Leo de delivered a session about CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is our managed service, allows you to capture all the events and the logs. So for Lambda, out of the box, we have three metrics for you. Uh, number of invocations, how many times the function runs, how much time it spends, the duration, and how many throttles or errors you have. That will be like in the metrics. Of course, you can create your custom metrics, right? And CloudWatch logs, after, every time you run, it will keep some logs for you, so you can go there, then if there's a log group, you can check out the logs. And we also have a lot of third-party tools to aggregate and visualize all the logs for you. Like, for example, Logly, Splunk, Sumo Logic, Data Logs, there are a lot of them. And of course, we also have our own service called X-Ray. Yes, this keynote from our CTO, actually, he had a few, he had a few slides about X3. X3 is an awesome service, provide you a visibility into your application. Not only for Lambda serverless, it's also for like EC2 applications for our managed service. So it will collect all the data for you and visualize for you, so give you a nice component graph about like what happens where, what's the botnet, right? So a lot of times you have logs, it's local, and you have local logs here and there, even you log the heck of it, and sometimes it's really hard to correlate that, that what's happening, right? So it's distributed microservice kind of, so you want this kind of tools to give you the visibility. Uh, it breaks down to your function performance. Uh, hopefully I can give you a demo. So, but here, the picture is like a service map. So it has two capabilities. It collects data, it gives you a service map. Basically it's a graph tell you all the components, how much time it spends, right? What's your like, transcription per second kind of things. And you can drill down to different segment. The segment tells you in this segment, how much time I spend, in this, that segment, how much time I spend. You can instrument your code to have more detailed information. Recap, put them together, you have a service map. It can identify where your errors or latency problems and you have a trace view, you can zoom in to determine what's the root cause. Fun part, demo. Yeah. So, all right, that's the uh, console. The first thing I wanna show you is the code star. So let's go to, you guys can see right now. Oh. 
uh, what's going on? Um, oh, it's, it's coming. Okay. All right. First thing, create a project. As I can show you, large templates. Because we're talking about service, I choose Lambda. For Lambda, you still have like eight of them. Like Node.js, it's a web application. Java Spring, web service, and Express, Python, right? So let's just do it. You know, so I give you a name, demo, project. So you can see in this picture, it would create a bunch of resources for you. Code commit repository, code build, code cloud formation, and cloud watch, right? So I hit create project. So it will start and it gives you some instruction how to use it in a Visual Studio, Eclipse, command line, this kind of things. So while we're waiting, so it will do the work. I already created a project. Of course, I already created one, right? So this one is a Java project based upon the Spring template. So you can see we have all those kind of things. And the nice thing over there, you can, there's an application ad port. I'll make it big for you guys. So if I click it, uh, hopefully it'll bring up my application. Uh, this is a Wi Fi co op. So oh, it's very vanilla application I made up, right? So basically it's a sort of feedback, nothing fancy. Uh, I can try. So uh, uh, nice day today. Uh, it's lame. Okay, so you can see I have this nice day today, but you can look at it. I have so have some issues, right? Because the second, the timestamp, it's all seconds, which is not really nice. It's not human readable. So I want to fix that. So I actually have code. I already have fix over there. So my fix is here. Fix me. So. Ta -ta. Ta -ta. Uh, so I have this one. I have uh, I have commit fix time. So what I'm going to do is just commit and push. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Go back to my code. So let's go back to the code star. You have this dashboard. At left side, you have all those shortcuts. So if I click code, it brings me to the code repository for my project. So if you look at commits, see, I already have a one fixed timestamp. So the code is already there. If I can, I can look at a different diff, right? So you say, oh yeah, I have the diff over there. So my code is already in. And of course, in code commit, you can do a lot of different things, right? You can compare, you can visualize, then you can have a trigger, basically trigger like Lambda, like I just did quick demo, so you can do SNS, send something to somebody, or you can do Lambda. Basically, I said it's an event source for my Lambda function. So that's a capability of code commit. Code commit provides you a service you can stand up your private repository in your account. So really nice for a lot of organizations, especially in public sector, right? They don't want to host anything in GitHub. I mean, it's public. So let me go back. So if I refresh, oh, I don't need to refresh. So you can see the pipeline here. My pipeline already kicks off because I already checking a code. And in the middle, you can see I already have my uh, commits over there. And in code style, you actually can move those tiles. You can rearrange them. Then you also can have like team wiki over there. It's like a markdown language. So I just mentioned this one. you have a kind of a single place to all the activities. And I also integrate with Jira from Atlanta, so you can see all the issue tracking kind of things. You can create an issue from here, or you can import issues, which is really nice. So my pipeline is running, then I want to show you some other things. So for the project, after it deploys, you can, from the project, you can see all the resources. So API Gateway, Cloud Formation, all those things, right? My Lambda function. Uh, what I'm trying to show you is I still go to code commit. I want to show you some code. So the template YAML file, that's, if you look at, uh, maybe make it bigger, 
it has this transform. What it means? It means it's a same template. So CloudFormation understand you, you have a same templates. So I can define a Lambda function over there. So you look at the type. It's a serverless function, so it's a Lambda function. So I define my handler, it's a Java handler, so the runtime would be Java 8, memory size, one gig, uh, 12 seconds timeout. Then this line here, tracing. So if I make it active, I would enable X3 tracing for my Lambda functions. A lot of times, sometimes they don't want to enable for production, right? It, it has a little bit overhead over there, but if you want to enable, you can just put it over there. So of course, it will create a row for me, and the events are from API. So I basically have this API gateway, three APIs. I can get something, feedback. I can create some feedback. And I can get actually index page. So my application just showed you it's completely like serverless. Then here, I have the reference to a DynamoDB table. So you can see the table is just here. So I just use all the default value. Just two lines, nothing else. Simple and easy, right? That's the same template. Then again, I want to show you the build spec. That's for the code build. So I have all some commands, right? When the build time, I echo something, move the pack, build, using Maven to build the package, and open the package, delete something, make it smaller. Then I use the cloud formation package, finally, to package everything, upload to S3, get URL back, generate another template, and uh, as my build artifacts, it's a te template export JSON. So that's the build. When it's done, code is already S3, the next stage will know where's my code. Okay, that's what I also want to show you. Okay, uh, quickly let's go to my Lambda function. So you can see the table name actually is a DynamoDB table, right? So that's how I define. The configuration, if you go to advanced, you can see, yeah, the memory is one gig uh, defined, 12 seconds, which is defined. And you can see that enable active tracing is already checked because I marked it active, right? Uh, that's my Lambda function. Quickly show you the API gateway. So as I said, three APIs. First one, get, and I have another feedback, get, and a post. It's very simple rest for APIs. You can define more, that's just my own, right? Uh, all right, DynamoDB table. I have this one table, I have items over there. If you make it bigger, I have a timestamp over there. So I just threw something over there. Uh, you can see nice day today is here. That's the one I just invert. I'll go back to my code style to see. Let's see if this stem project, oh, it's still working on it. Uh, this one. So it's in the last day. So let's go to our pipelines. Code pipeline details. So you can see my pipeline, I didn't do anything, right? I just in the code star say, oh, there's a project. Then code, pi, code star will automatically create these pipelines for me. It has a source and do the build and do the deploy. The deploy has two steps, create the change set, executed, as I mentioned. So if you look at the details, it's seeing update in progress, right? Uh, still working on it. Then this is, uh, I think we can see the change set here. So that's the change set for cloud formation. So you can see nicely what's being changed. It's modified. I'm going to remove something and I'm going to add something. Okay, let's refresh a little bit. So that's pretty much I want to show you. I'm so I'm just waiting for my changes being completed. I actually should finish already, but uh, let's see. Uh, oh, the extensions. Uh, again, you can connect to Jira, right? It's very popular issue tracking tools. And of course, you have Teams. Uh, right now, it's myself. If you want add additional team members, it's controlled by IAM. You can create IAM users, add to your team, give them different permissions. They can do different things, read only or checking code, these kind of things. 
Uh, the pipeline is here. I'll already click this. Uh, let's see. Oh, update complete. So nice. Let's go back to code star. A lot of times, code star has a little bit delay, so it's, no, it's deployed complete. So my stage is complete. So let's go back to my function. So now you can see I have like eight minutes, so eight seconds. I have like 70 hours. Like last time I have like three days. So I fixed the issue for myself. And the last thing I want to show you is X-ray. So the service mapping takes a few seconds to compute. So first we go to trees. So from trees, you can see we have trees over there. Uh, let me run a few times. So, okay, uh, I just had something like test, uh, test. I'm just get lazy. So I just refresh a couple times, make sure my land function got invoked. So I have more data in my X-ray. So I refresh. So you can see, okay, X-ray captured all those like uh, events for me. And you see, sometimes it's real quick. Response time is like 12 milliseconds, less than 100. And the very beginning, it takes like three, eight seconds, 1.8 seconds. So we want to know why. If you click into it, you can see the initialization take some time. So we call it code star. First, first time Lambda has to download, have to stand up a container for you, download the code, and if it's Java, it starts JVM. So those activities take time. So it takes like a few seconds, not a few seconds, one point some second, uh, 1.8 seconds. Then this one, why this one is longer? Because we initialize a DynamoDB table. I actually did a scan, which is not best practice, right? You probably should have a sort key and do a query. Or maybe just fetch one item. So, but I just do a whole scan. And we go back to the service mapping. It's still computing. So, let's go. so if you look at the other ones, other ones are really quick. It's warm. Everything's up and running. You do it. takes like 12 milliseconds. Okay, I have my service map. So you can see, okay, different components, right? User request comes in, the first component try to stand up something, then the next, it will run it, then connect to my DynamoDB table here. Then if you click, it go back to nice service details over there, right? Uh, give you all those percentage, really nice. So you can view trees, they go back to the trees view. Then the legend is like, if you have arrows, then you have arrows, then success, like faults. Of course, my application is perfect. I have all the screen. Uh, all right, that I think concludes my demo. So I have two more slides. Thank you. So, Again, service computing is awesome. We have a web page for it. Check it out and read all those great things. And additional resources. So we have all those links over there. And finally, thank you.